Deep in the heart of the Blue Ridge Mountains, there sits a place steeped in history and natural beauty, Wilkes County, North Carolina. From its early roots in the American Revolution to its pivotal role in the moonshine trade and the birth of NASCAR, Wilkes County is a captivating blend of past and present. In this place, one of its very own became the last American hero. Today, we're diving into the life of a legend, Junior Johnson. From his humble beginnings in the hills of North Carolina, to his rise as one of the most influential figures in racing history, Johnson's story is a thrilling ride of resilience, innovation, and raw talent. Born in 1931, Robert Glenn Johnson Jr.'s racing career was as much a product of his environment as it was his undeniable talent behind the wheel. The Johnson family had been involved in illegal moonshine even before Jr.'s birth. His father notoriously spent nearly a third of his life behind bars for running shine. But that's what the family business was. In many parts of Appalachia, especially in that time, there was no upward mobility. You did what you had to do to survive. Moonshine running, or bootlegging, played an enormous role in the birth of stock car racing. During the Prohibition era in the United States from 1920 to 1933, moonshiners would modify their cars to outrun law enforcement, enhancing speed and handling. These modifications allowed the cars to maintain a normal appearance while improving performance, thus creating the concept of a stock car. These cars may have looked normal on the outside, but on the inside, they were a totally different beast. When Prohibition ended, these moonshiners had developed impressive driving skills from outrunning the police on backcountry roads across the south. Some of them started to race each other for fun, which eventually led to organized races. These organized races grew until a man by the name of Bill France formed the National Association for Stock Car Racing, uniting most of stock car racing under a central banner. Starting his NASCAR career in 1955, Johnson's time as a driver was nothing short of spectacular, and perhaps somewhat overlooked considering his contributions as a car owner and builder. With 50 victories under his belt, he was one of the most successful drivers of his time. He may not have won a title, and his driving career was actually halted for some time due to serving a prison sentence after federal officials caught him firing up an old still one night, but as a driver, he certainly was a threat anytime he showed up. Despite retiring from driving in 1966, Johnson's impact on NASCAR was far from over. He transitioned into one of the most successful team owners in NASCAR history, leading his team to six Winston Cup Series championships. But what really made Johnson a true NASCAR legend was not just his victories, but his innovative spirit. During practice for the 1960 Daytona 500, just the second time the 500 was ever held, Johnson realized that he could increase his own car's speed if he was able to stay right behind a faster car and then eventually pass that faster car. During the race itself, he used this technique and went on to win the race. Before this point, I'm not sure that aerodynamics had been much of an idea in stock car racing. I'm sure some guys understood that certain cars went through the air better, but being that most races were on short tracks back then, it was not a huge deal. And it's not like Junior Johnson or most of the other guys were college-educated engineers, Far from it, actually, but he just had ingenuity and cleverness that served him well. That cleverness manifested itself in several ways. For basically his entire career, Junior Johnson bent the rules. In order to find that advantage over the competition, you have to come up with new tricks. Johnson was the best at that, being crafty enough to skirt inspection. I love the game, he said. Maybe I'd have four or five new things on a car that might raise a question but I'd always leave something that was outside of the regulations in a place where the inspectors could easily find it. They'd tell me it was illegal, I'd plead guilty, and they'd carry it away thinking they caught me, but they didn't check some other things that I thought were even more special. There's a lot of stories of what kinds of stunts he pulled, some with actual sources and some that may or may not just be urban legend. One well-documented event is the 1966 race at Atlanta Motor Speedway. To set the scene, in 1966, Ford Motor Company is locked in a heated confrontation with NASCAR brass over engine rules. Ford decides to boycott, but after several races of the big Ford stars staying home, NASCAR officials can tell that attendance is down. There were a lot of Ford fans after all, so the prevailing theory is that NASCAR might have been willing to turn a blind eye during pre-race inspection if a top Ford entry was willing to come back into the fold. At the request of Holman Moody, a Ford factory team, Junior Johnson shows up to Atlanta with a 66 Ford Galaxy that looks suspiciously different than a Galaxy you'd see on the street. The rear end curved upward, the nose downward, and the roof line was lowered. In those days you had to sell a certain number of cars to be able to run it in NASCAR, 
and there was never any Ford Galaxy that looked like this. With its yellow paint scheme, it earned the nickname Yellow Banana due to its odd curvature. Although it was extremely fast and driven by Fred Lorenzen, who was great at the bigger tracks, it hit the wall 139 laps in and never made another appearance. Later on down the line, Junior teamed up with a hotshot by the name of Darrell Waltrip. DW drove for Junior for six years from 1981 to 1986 and won three Winston Cup titles. This stretch cemented DW as the winningest driver of the 1980s. But DW also had the nickname Jaws due to his big mouth. Although he didn't give every secret away, he has been more than willing to talk about some things the Johnson crew got up to during that time. It's 1985 and title sponsor Winston decides they're going to run an invitational race before the Coca-Cola 600 and give out a large payday to the winner, thus creating the all-star race. At the end of only 105 miles, Waltrip won, but as he crossed the finish line, his engine blows and spews white smoke all over the track during the cooldown lap. Due to Johnson's history, theories start going everywhere. Some say DW intentionally blew the motor by downshifting at higher revs. Others go as far to say that Junior remotely made the engine expire. As DW told Auto Week, there was an amazing amount of effort put into that race. Junior ground a set of rods that would only run as long as he thought they needed to run. He did the same thing with pistons and the crank. He used his experience to make that motor good for only as long as it needed to be. Sure, Junior Johnson may have been an engineering wizard, but I don't know if he was that good at making his engine stop running when the race immediately ended. DW was definitely more coy on this topic than he normally is, so we can assume some trickery was absolutely at play here. Another alleged story is one having to do with carburetors. Junior Johnson's team was at the top of NASCAR, and many teams tried to emulate that success. The story goes that Junior Johnson knew other teams had figured out where he ordered his parts from. So in his wisdom, he decides to pull a little switcheroo. He found the worst possible carburetor supplier he could on the market, bought an entire fleet of carburetors from him in an attempt to trick others into believing they were the best carburetors. I don't know if this story is actually accurate, but it fits right in within Junior's wheelhouse. These sorts of stories serve to highlight the mentality of a man who grew up dirt poor, who had to be clever or street smart in order to make it. For most of his time in the sport, the big money had not come into it yet. His driving career predates Winston entering the scene and creating NASCAR's modern era. He was building cars from the 1950s to the 1990s, and his genius and technical knowledge essentially wrote the NASCAR rulebook for them, with all the crazy things that he did. I don't know if any one man was more responsible for the evolution of NASCAR from a technical standpoint than Junior Johnson. Tom Wolfe wrote The Last American Hero for Esquire magazine in 1965, delving into the world of Wilkes County that produced Junior Johnson and illustrating what Junior's life had been like to that point. It was so well received that it was eventually turned into a movie, with Jeff Bridges starring as a highly fictionalized version of Johnson. After this article, Junior earned a cult-like following. He meant so much to the people of North Wilkesboro, and he lived there the rest of his life. The first half of the 20th century produced a society that needed to overcome immense challenges, from the Great Depression to World War II. Moonshine running was hard, but Junior Johnson had come out the other side of it and created an incredible life for himself. The title of Last American Hero is absolutely fitting. Johnson is a prime example of the sort of tenacity and ingenuity that has somewhat slipped away from the average American man in recent generations. Junior Johnson's legacy in NASCAR is undeniable. From his humble beginnings to his innovative contributions to the sport, Johnson truly was unique. His story is a testament to the spirit of the early days of stock car racing a sport where determination, innovation, and courage led to legendary status. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more NASCAR stories. Until next time, keep your passion for racing alive.